And so I really feel led to bring uh, that uh, before you, and it's from Hebrews chapter 2. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, and I'm going to read just the first two verses uh, of that uh, for us today. Uh, but before I do read it, I, I want to put it in this setting. Um, you know, there's a saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, and uh, it, it's a nice saying, uh, but it's easier said than done. Uh, and in a, in a real sense, uh, we are living in tough times. Now, the reality is, beloved, we've always been living in tough times. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, another, another addition, another burden of toughness because of what we face with this recurring issue of, of pandemic around us. But it's always been tough times. In fact, uh, if you think about it, uh, when you think about the world in which we live, and especially Christians around the world, we, we got it easy in a lot of ways. Because there are many believers in many lands who are sorely persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. We have the wonderful privilege of living in a land where we're free to worship according to our conscience. Um, and uh, although that poses some problems, it's many blessings. But that's not to say that the going doesn't get tough for us. And uh, so how do, we, how do we approach living in these days? Now, the writer of Hebrews uh, was writing to Hebrew Christians who were suffering because of their faith. They were being persecuted. And uh, the unfolding of Hebrews is just an explanation of how Jesus is so, mar so far superior uh, in terms of what God brings to us than what the Jewish religion through the law of Moses had. All right. Uh, and then he talks about those who suffered for their faith in chapter 11. Uh, he's talking about the, um, uh, 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 actually the heroes of faith in the Old Testament, not all of them but those who suffered and endured suffering because they believed God and they wanted to be faithful to God. And then in chapter 12, he, he takes that and he points it to the reader. Now, the reader of 2,000 years ago is a little different than the reader of today, but it's still pointed to the reader. God is speaking to us. And when the Spirit of God inspired the writer of Hebrews to write these words, it was not meant just for a particular time and place or even a particular situation, but it was intended for we who face tough times at various times in life. Uh, and our brother prayed about the spirit of depression. I mean, we, we, I, I read an article that there's a mental health crisis going on in the United States you know, attributable, uh, perhaps, to this plague. But maybe not. Maybe not, because we know about the terrible increase in, and spread of, of, of addictions in our land that was taking place even before this. So, so we, we're living in tough times. And so how do we, how do we live? Uh, the word that's used today uh, is... Um, Resilience. Have you heard that word uh, at all? Resilience. It means, you know, resilience means it's something that, that kind of, well, I, I actually have a definition. It's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Um, and so um, difficulties come, we're affected, but we're resilient. And that's what we need to have, resilience. But the other word is endurance. Uh, we kind of endure. We, we, we hold on. We don't, we don't fold up. We don't let go. So where does resilience and where does this uh, endure, uh, 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 resilience and endurance come from? So uh, that's, that's what this passage is about. Uh, and so looking at Hebrews 12, the first two verses, and I'll make a couple of comments as we go along, and then I, I really want to ask two questions of this passage. And these questions, the answers to these questions, kind of merge. They kind of merge to speak to us today. And I'll tell you what the questions are after I read the passage. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are the, those are the heroes of faith in the Old Testament he's been talking about, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts uh, please you, and Lord, I pray that your truth would be um, penetrate deeply into our souls so that knowing and believing your truth, we would be made strong in Christ to follow our Savior and to serve you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I, you know, I thank you for these dear brothers and sisters on this, uh, on this day coming to gather to praise and worship you. Thank you for their hearts to seek after you. Thank you, Lord, for drawing them to yourself and even to this place today. And Lord, uh, we believe you have blessing for us here. We've been blessed already as we've worshiped and as we've prayed. And now, Lord, we open our hearts even wider for the blessing of truth, your truth, to come into our souls and make us strong to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, as I said, you know, the setting for this is uh, chapter 11, the heroes of faith, and, and he picks up on that, on, the, on that in the first part of this chapter, you know, therefore being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, uh, it's interesting how people interpret the scripture. <clears throat> and I, you know, I've been a student of the scripture for years. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard and given a lot of sermons, read a lot of commentaries and, you know, experts and scholars. But there are, there are two basic interpretations of this, being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. One is that it's like we are running a race in a stadium and, and all the saints of old who've gone before us are kind of cheering us on, you know, a cloud of witnesses. It's a nice thought, but I don't, I don't believe that's really what it is. These are witnesses not to us, but these are witnesses to God and his faithfulness. So we're surrounded by the examples of people of faith. Now, for them in the Old Testament, for us in the scriptures and 2,000 years of Christian history, who lived their lives in faithfulness to Christ. And that kind of is an inspiration for us that, you know, they did it and I... I I'm not going to let them down in their witness. I don't want to let God down, but I'm not going to let them down. So that's, I, think, I believe that's the cloud of witnesses, witnesses to God's faithfulness. Where we have this long, long, uh, maybe the word is history, but this, this great multitude of people who've gone before us, who've set the example for us. But he doesn't say we should look at the witnesses. He's just saying it's a fact. You know, look, look, at, look, at your, look at what you've received. Look at what people have paid for you to get to be where you are today. You know, look at it, he's saying. But don't look at them. We're, the one way to look at is Jesus. And, and there are two, two, two questions, I believe, that, that, uh, that emerge from this passage for me. The first is, what is this race that we're supposed to run? And the second is, what is the joy that's set before Jesus? All right? And if we answer both those questions from the Scripture, I believe we, they, they, they give light to each other, and they give inspiration, encouragement, resilience, endurance, strength and grace to us. So, what are we to do? Being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he says, let us, um, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings closely, and let us run 
with endurance. Uh, and here the image, of course, is a runner. You know, uh, runners don't, don't, don't run with their overcoats on. You know, they, 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 try, to, they try to get as light as possible. Um, I found out the difference between running shoes and walking shoes, by the way, a number of years ago. I went, I went to my, the, my podiatrist, and my podiatrist said, um, why are you wearing these sneakers? I said, the sneakers? I, a sneaker's a sneaker. Oh, no, she said. There are sneakers, and then there are sneakers. This is a walking shoe. You want a running shoe. And she get, put a walking shoe in one hand and a running shoe in the other hand, and I'll tell you, the weight of each was very different. The running shoe was very light. I mean, just, I mean, that's just the shoes. Well, anything that would weigh a runner down, a runner wants to do without. And, of course, here he says, let us lay aside. What? What are we to lay aside? Every weight and sin which clings so closely. He doesn't just say lay, lay aside weight. He doesn't say just lay aside sin. He says weight and sin, because not every weight is a sin. Every sin is a weight, I believe. But there are things that weigh us down, you know, that aren't, aren't sins in God's eyes, but they kind of they add to our burden unnecessarily. You know, so Jesus says, you know, why are you anxious about your life, what you shall eat or drink or what you shall wear? You know, behold the lilies of the field. So we have anxieties about things that we shouldn't be anxious about. Paul says in Philippians, he says, uh, in, uh, in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which passes. All understanding will keep your heart and mind. So we... We have burdens and cares that we don't make known to God. We don't unload them. So we're to, to lay aside weights and sins, which easily beset us, so we can run the race, so we could be, so we could be fit to run the race. Uh, and then, um, I believe, uh, you know, that I think he's, it, it's clear. He's talking to a group of believers who are under difficult situations because of their faith. We have a common, we have a common race to run. Now, the question, of course, that I ask is, what is the race? You don't have to be a genius to answer that question. I'm glad because I'm not quite at the genius level yet. I'm, I'm still hoping I'll get there someday. <laughs> well, what's, what's, what's the heart of God's call on us as believers? Well, it's found in, in the Gospels again and again. When Jesus wanted someone, he'd say, follow me. Our call is to follow Jesus. And what's Jesus want us to do? He says, abide in me. Let my word abide in you. You know? Again and again, we have the call to follow Christ, which means to really be in fellowship with Jesus. That's the race I believe that we're called to run. And now, to be in fellowship with Jesus includes, but it's not limited to, being in fellowship with God's people. And I can go on and on here, but I don't want to, because it's going to take me away from where I really want to go. But, but that's, that's what our common calling is. That's what our common race is. Everybody, every one of us, the Lord says, follow me. He says, abide in me. Every single one. Now, that's the race we're all called to run. And then we have, I think, individual races. You know, we have individual callings in our life. Are you married? God calls you to be a good husband. He calls you to be a good wife. Are you a parent? God calls you to raise your children in such a way so that you don't rouse them to anger. Are you a child? Now, there are no children here, so I'm going to skip that one. Are you employed? Well, God calls you to be a good worker. 
Martin Luther says, the, the cobbler makes shoes to the glory of God. You know? I, are you an employer? Well, God tells you to treat your employees with respect and care. But, you know, I, you go on and on. And then I think each of us, in a way, has a calling in life. There is that common calling that we all have. I mean, you shall be my witnesses. We're all called, we're all called somehow to, to bear testimony to who God is. Now, we have problems there sometimes. Because sometimes we're more worried about what people think than what about the Lord thinks. You know, it's, it's wonderful to, to be in a place where it's okay to praise the Lord and thank him. But sometimes we don't carry that same language of praise the Lord and thank the Lord into places outside the church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not trying to lay guilt on this. I'm just, I'm just acknowledging that this is part of the race we're called to run. So the race that we're called to run really is a race, though, to have fellowship with Jesus. And when that's in place, then everything else takes place. And his call is to follow me. I, I remembered uh, uh, an old hymn from my childhood, so you know it's old. And it was probably written before then. It was, it's called Jesus Calls Us. But there's a verse that comes to mind. It says, in our joys and in our sorrows, I love this line, days of toil and hours of ease. Life seems that way, doesn't it? Days of toil and hours of ease. Still he calls in cares and pleasures. Christian, love me more than these. You know, and that's, that's always the call. Christian, love me more than these, any, any, anything that's a these out there. And then here, here's the next question. So what is it that we're to follow? Of course, we're to follow Jesus. Uh, it's so easy, isn't it, to, um, with, the, with, the, with the currents and the pushes and the pulls of life to get off course. Uh, it, it's, uh, the image that comes to mind is rowing a boat. Do you ever row a boat? Now, rowing a boat is strange because you're going in one direction, but you're looking in the other. I mean, isn't that crazy? I mean, wish somebody would figure out, well, I guess you could row forward if you wanted to. But that's a little more difficult right? because it's better to row backward. Well, I, 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 I have rowed a boat in the past. Uh, I'm on a lake, I'm rowing a boat. I want to go from one side to the other and to a point on the other side. But as I'm rowing, I turn around, and I look, and I'm not heading to that point anymore. So I change my direction. And then I turn around, and I look, and I'm, I'm not heading to that point anymore. I change my direction again. You, you know what I mean? I'm, so I don't row a boat like this. I row a boat like this. And then I found out something. If I row a boat, and I keep my eye on something on the opposite shore and keep that in the center... I'll go in a straight line. Now, that may be a silly illustration, but I think it's an illustration of a point. The point is that we have to keep our eyes on Jesus because then we'll always be going in the right direction. And when we take our eyes off of Jesus, no matter what the reason may be, no matter what the reason may be, then we start to go off course. So he, the author of the Hebrew says, let us run the race before us, fixing. I, I don't know if that's the word that's used here. Let's see. Looking, he says. But, but the idea of looking, it doesn't mean you just look. It's, it's kind of focus, fixing your eyes on Jesus. You know, beloved, one of the calls of God on us is to keep our, our focus on the Lord. You know, and I, I just want to ask you a question. How's, how's your focus these days? This is important when we come and we worship because it kind of it re-centers us. Jesus be the center. We sang it today. It, it kind of re-centers us and refocuses. But how do I do it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? You know what I mean? How do I do it when the Eagles lose today? Oh, 
I don't, I don't, scratch that, scratch that from the tape. I, did, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but you know what I mean? So, so there's, there's got to be this, for me, of course, even when I'm looking at that thing, that fixed point, you know, I, it tends to move on that side, and so I have to go a little more on this side, and it tends to move on that side, I have to go a little more on this side. Yeah, I mean, you've got to keep making those mid-course corrections, as it were. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, let's, let's continue. The founder and perfecter of our faith, I'm, I'm going to skip that because it's very obvious, maybe, but there's a lot to be said there. Now, here's where I want to land with you. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame? Now, what was the joy, or what is the joy, that was set before Jesus? I always, now this is a, this is a guy who went to seminary, I went to postgraduate school, I've been preaching for f a long time. <laughs> you know, I've heard many sermons, this is a very famous passage. I always... I always thought that the joy that was set before him was being with his father. Was the resurrection, ascension, the enthronement of Jesus in heaven at the right hand of the father. You know, I, I figured that was the joy. He was looking forward to that. And then I read something. And this person said something that made sense to me. She, she said... Jesus had all these things before he came to earth. He was at the right hand of the Father. He was in the beginning with God. Nothing was made with, by him except, and uh, everything was made by him, and, and uh, uh, nothing was made by, uh, uh, well, you know what I mean. Everything was made by him. That's good enough. Everything was made by him. I mean, he was with God from the beginning. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the word. I mean, so he was with the Father and the Spirit from eternity. They, we say eternity past, but eternity doesn't have a past or a future. That's a time reference. Eternity surrounds and, and engulfs time. He, so why, why did he come to earth? He didn't come to earth. Right, now, and of course, we're in familiar territory here. He didn't come to earth in order to go back to heaven. We say, and I think rightly so in many ways, he came to earth to die on the cross. But you know, you think about it, the cross wasn't his final destination. He died on the cross to win to himself a people who would belong to him exclusively. He died to save me from my sin and its penalty, and its power, and its presence. He died to save me from my sin, but he died to make me his own. So when you think about it, Jesus came to earth to die for me. He came to earth to die for you. There's even a song. You, we are the reason that he gave his life. We are the reason that he suffered and died. So what is the joy that was set before Jesus? Who for the joy set before him? Well, it's us. The joy that is set before Jesus is you and me in fellowship with Jesus. Not some kind of class of people who all of a sudden are going to go to heaven when they die, although that's true. But we are the reason that he, has the, that he endured the cross and despised the shame because we would belong to him and he would belong to us. And so he would, he would come, and I heard someone put it this way once, the, the final destination of Jesus in terms of his coming to earth was our hearts. He wants to dwell in us. And that's what Christmas is all about. You know, Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. But there's also the sign that he came to dwell in our hearts. 
And so we open our hearts to him. So we are the reason. I, uh, I, I remember something that happened to me a number of years ago. And, um, you know, God teaches you lessons sometimes that you remember for the rest of your life. But it taught me this truth. I can have Jesus as my Savior, but I could have him closed out of my heart. My heart's door has a, little, has a spring on it that always wants to swing closed. And I have to keep coming to him and opening my heart's door and letting him in. I'm not talking about losing my salvation. Please understand that. That's not the issue. I, I am saved. I know that. I'm secure in that. But my sense of fellowship, you understand, with the living Savior has to be renewed, restored by me. He's, he's Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and, and have, stop, have fellowship with them and they with me. We often apply that to unbelievers, but that's, that word was spoken to a church, by the way. In Revelation 3.20. It was spoken to Christians, by the way. So anyway, this experience that I had. What time is it? I, time goes by. Uh, anyway, this experience that I had. And then I'm, I'm winding toward a close. You don't know what that means. Only I do. <laughs> but many, many, many years ago, I was a pastor in New York, and I took a group of young people to a Riverside Church in Upper Manhattan, which was a they call it the Protestant Cathedral, to a Christmas concert. I thought, wouldn't this be nice? You know, take a group of our youth to, to a Christmas concert, you know, and they'll, they'll hear, you know, the wonderful carols, hark the herald, and joy to the world, and all those good ones, you know. And uh, so we got on the subway train, rode up to A train, up to, up to Upper Manhattan, went to Riverside Church. I'll never forget. The church was crowded, so we had to sit in a balcony, and it was hot in the balcony. And uh, it, it was kind of dimly lit in the balcony, and the stage was far away. And I thought, oh, here we are. Well, all right, we'll wait for the concert to, to, to start. The concert starts, and they're not singing Joy to the World and Hark the Herald of Angels Sing. They're singing classical Christmas music that I didn't know. And that my young people didn't know. You know, and I, listen, this is just a confession. When I hear things like that and I'm unfamiliar, I, I just kind of get turned off. So I'm starting to get critical in myself. Why, why are they saying this stuff? Looking at the young people, they seem distracted. And they keep going. And, I, and I'm going, oh, this is terrible. Why are they doing this? I mean, this is not no way to have a Christmas concert. I'm judging and then uh, the intermission comes in, and uh, the person leading says, all right, now we're going to sing a Christmas song. I thought, oh, oh, come all you faithful, hark the herald. We're going to sing, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne. I thought, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne? I don't know that. And they start to sing it. And I'm like, why couldn't they pick a carol that we know? <laughs> you know, that was my spirit. And we start to sing, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. And I sang that chorus and it started, the words of the chorus started to enter my soul my heart and I started to mean it and then he sang the second verse heaven's arches rang and the angels sang proclaiming thy royalty decree but in lowly birth didst thou come to earth and in deepest humility O oh, come to my heart Lord Jesus and I sang it the second time and I, I, I meant it more there were five verses Jesus' earthly life, his earthly ministry, his death, his resurrection. Each time I sang it, oh, come 
to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. And each time I sang it, beloved, I meant it more. And I want to tell you, by the time we finished singing that song, my heart's door was open, and that was a glorious service. It was filled with the presence of God. See, the problem wasn't out there. The problem was here. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, because he wanted Bob Santilli's presence with himself. He wanted to be with me. And I had him as my savior. And so all I'm saying is, this, this is the very heart of what we are called to do, to be in this fellowship, this relationship with Jesus, who, who for the joy that was set before him, you're his joy. It's, it's like when you, you know, if you have an adult child that you haven't seen for a while, you see him again, you know, and he, your heart fills with joy because you love him. You're his joy. I'm his joy. And I believe this is what it means. This is what it means to run the race. To make sure our heart is open to relationship with Jesus. So that all the joy that he wants and he wants us to have can be there. And then we get endurance. We get resilience to run the race that is set before us because we're not running on our own steam, which gives out. We're renewed by his spirit in the, in, a, in the innermost being. Oh, beloved, this is what God has for us. And one of the many ways, and this is winding to the close, this is getting to the close, but one of the many ways, I, but what, so we have to find our way, each of us, each of us to be in fellowship with Jesus constantly. Part of that is being in fellowship with his people. But it's spending time opening our hearts. One of the ways I, I find a way to do that is I learned a long time ago. For me, every day, early in the day, I need to take time just to be in the presence of the Lord. Song, scripture, prayer. I need that. I need it desperately. And for the last two years, I've needed it even more than ever. But I need that. And, and one of the songs that I started to listen, I, I choose a song of the week. I have a song of the week that I, that I listen to. Well, this became a song of the month, then it became a song of two months. And I'm going to invite you to sing it as we close the worship. But it's called The Power of His Love. You know, hold me close, put your arms around me. You know, that, that personal relationship with God. And I find this, I let the truth of that song, the truth of the go godly songs, the truth of the scripture, the truth of the Lord penetrate my soul and just open my heart to him. I find strength for the living. And that's why, that's why, when the going gets difficult, and it often does, because of presence of Jesus with me. I don't collapse. And because he's faithful, and his faithfulness endures forever, his love endures forever, his faithfulness to all generations, because of Jesus, no matter what happens, I never will. Let's pray. Lord, help us to simply...